Welcome to the Zanbergen Report, where wealth strategies and pop culture collide. Featuring your distinguished host and certified financial planner, Bart Zandbergen. Welcome to our show of Dream Chasers and Wealth Makers. We are thrilled to be back in the studio today with a new episode of the Zanbergen Report. I'm proud to bring in the movers, shakers, and difference makers who are passionate about sharing what they have learned and what you need to know today. And today I'm very pleased to announce we are doing the probably our favorite show of the year, which is our annual wine tasting show. So I'm happy to say that in studio today, we have my friend and publicist, Paula Stoyer. Paula, welcome. Back for the third year in a row. Third Wouldn't miss year. it. Best podcast all year long. Yeah. And I'm also happy to announce that we are in a, uh, a new studio with our friends at the Optimized Advisor, who have their own podcast. And we have Danielle Ramchandani and Scott Heinle. Welcome, guys. Oh, thanks for having yes. us. Yes. Wish I could be there in person. Yeah, I think it's probably fair to announce that Scott is visiting us virtually. So he's going to help with the questions, but not participate in the tasting. So, um, which all that means really is that we have more to taste. (laughs) (laughs) Please Uh, indulge on my behalf, please. (laughs) All right. So the theme of the show today is holiday um, wine pairing. And with the holidays right upon us, we're kind of in the middle, but we certainly have a big month in December. So um, we thought we would talk about kind of a a, um, a series of wines that one might have during the day, depending on what your celebration is. And I have lined up uh, four bottles here. And one of the things I wanted to do was talk about, obviously, each wine, what I might pair with. But also, we'll talk to our guests here about maybe what they have during their holiday meals and we can talk about if any of these would work or if we need to um, pair something else. And with each of the wines today, by now, most of the listeners and people who know me know I have a, a definitely a, a, a tendency to lean towards a couple of wines, uh, Champagne and Pinot Noir. So today I did try to mix it up, and we'll, we'll kind of cover those as we go along. You want to say anything, Paula, as we get started? I have a question for you, a burning question. All right. I know. So I was not a Pinot Noir fan. For many years, I know. Mm. I converted in the last year. I really, really am enjoying Pinot Noirs, but I am curious to know what your favorite Pinot Noir is. So that's a great question, and I have several, and it's really driven more by the region than, um, and then secondarily by the producer. So I love the regions of Willamette Valley, which is in Oregon. Um, It's a little cooler there. So bottom line is I like areas that are cooler. So I think it brings bigger bodied, full body, almost, I would call it a cab lover's Pinot to okay. me. So more full body to darker color. Um, Costa Brown comes to mind. Um, uh, Antica Terra up in Willamette Valley. Costa Brown is down in um, Central Coast. Uh, Babcock makes an amazing. Um, Pantene, uh, which is um, uh, owned by an ex-hockey player, Jim Fox, has wonderful winemakers. So those are off the top of my head, I think three. Good intel for me. Yeah. I know. I was thinking about that over Thanksgiving, and I thought, oh, I wish I had asked him that. I always stick with my my safe, you know, Pinots, which right. is like my Belle Gloss, for example. Which is, I only, thank you, I recently was introduced to them, and those have, that has recently risen to the top of my top 10. Very, oh, very nice. Okay, then I have to ask you, because Belle Gloss has three, Belle Gloss Pinot Noir has three different versions. Mm-hmm. Which one do you like? Because there's Dairyman, Clark and Telephone. So bad. I'm forgetting the name of the third one. So the only one I've had so far is Clark and Telephone. Okay, that seems to be anybody's favorite when I ask them this question. Yeah, so I have to. I need to try the other two. You do. So we need a Pinot Noir party. 100%. Next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, I think. Very po- because here's the other thing. You and I have recently also enjoyed some New Zealand Pinot Noirs that um, we've become very fond of. Yep. Craggy Range being one of those wineries. And then the one I was going to add domestically here is William Sell, which we've also recently shared that is also very good. You know, the one thing that a lot of people don't really recognize with different Pinots and specific Pinot makers is the fact that within the one label, they might make six, seven, eight different varieties of Pinot from specific vineyards that are comprised of that winemaker. Right. And they're very different in flavor and taste from each of those specific vineyards. 
Such a good point. I didn't realize that at all until I started realizing that there were different names on these Bell Gloss bottles and they had very different <clears throat> tastes. So that's that's an excellent point. Um, and thanks to you, I'm now on allocation unto my wife's um, begrudgingly um, accepted of uh, William Salem. So um, they're one of my favorites now as well. Um, and that also brings to mind um, Hall is a really big wine producer and well-known up in Napa, but they have a sister company called Walt, and they're primarily Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which are the Burgundy um, wines. And what I love, part of their, um, I guess you call it marketing, um, they call it Thousand Miles of Pinot. So they actually, to Scott's point, they, cre- uh, they create uh, um, wines from Pinot Noir that are uh, grown from as high as Willamette Valley, all the way down to Santa Barbara, which is roughly a thousand miles. Interesting. Yeah. Fun wow. fact. And each one's a bit different. Yep. All right. So while I, I purposefully did not bring a Pinot Noir because that would be too easy, <laughs> um, but I did in a very indirect way. So today we're going to start with a sparkling wine. As a matter of fact, it is a champagne. And why is it a champagne, Paula? Because it was made in champagne. Champagne, France, exactly yes. right. So many wines can be, sparkling wine can be made in, with the exact same method, which is called method champenois, but unless it's made in champagne, it cannot be called champagne. So, and then everything I tried to do today was just slightly off normal uh, Ooh, in a good way. Breaking your discipline cycle. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> or, you know, predictable. <laughs> Mark, they're predictable. I like it. So I did bring a champagne. I brought one of my favorite brands, which is uh, Nicolas Fulet, sometimes referred to as Nicky F in the industry. <laughs> uh, but instead of a brute, I actually brought a rosé. Delicious. Yeah. And I haven't even had it yet. And so I kind of set it up. What do you think the primary grape in a rosé, in this particular rosé um, champagne is? Pinot. In anyone? Yes. It's 90, this one's 90% Pinot and about 10% Chardonnay. Which, by the way, in any sh- uh, champagne, those are the two grapes. So it's um, even oh. if it's a even if it's a brut, so non rosé, it's still Pinot Noir grapes and uh, Chardonnay, unless it says Blanc de Blanc. That means it's just Chardonnay. I didn't know that. Okay. Mm. Mm. It's the purpose of today. Learn something. So one of my favorite sounds in the entire world. <laughs> <sighs> wow. Oh, that's not the first time I've heard you say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the tell, Danielle. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. That's a pretty good sound, too. Agreed. I like that color. Beautiful. Absolutely yeah, beautiful. That's Scott, what is your typical um, your typical meal, holiday meal? So we're talking about Christmas. Yes. Yeah. So my th- that's an interesting question. My my favorite is a prime rib. However, that's a major- the minority in my household. Um, so as of late, it's been a, a prime roast. Okay. We're not a big turkey family, so we don't do the turkey ham thing on Christmas. It's definitely more of the red meat variety. Um, And there's nothing that compares to like a nice, slow-cooked roast. Um, And then we'll pair it with Brussels sprouts and bacon and a nice kale salad, maybe some garlic bread. So that's our typical Christmas dinner. All right. What kind of wine do you normally pair with that? So the default in the family would certainly be, would be more of a cab with that kind of a drink. Yeah. But lately I've been doing maybe some cab franc. Mm. All right. Which, which I, for whatever reason, I'll end up getting maybe a few a year from some of the allocations that we're a part of. Yeah. And I save them for that time of the year, you know, a hundred percent cab franc. Is it just, this, I don't know. It's something that, Tell me if I'm wrong, but it's something that just connects the holidays and being a little bit colder outside. It's certainly more of a bold taste and a strong finish, and it just goes really well with either a prime rib or a roast. Yeah, I, I think that's a great choice. It, it's right up there with a cab, I think, a cab or a cab franc. Um, cab franc is primarily a, 
It's more commonly used as a blending grape, like in a Bordeaux blend, and less as a 100%. Um, but I have had them before, and I think they're, they're quite nice. I, um, <laughs> so I was recently at my wine cellar, and I was given um, way more cases than I thought I had, like nine cases that had backed up, <laughs> which thankfully Tehani is not able to count that high yet. <laughs> well, she can't count that high, but she didn't count to tell her mom how many cases of wine. And I was opening one, and I started um, putting them away, and I looked at this, and it, it didn't, I didn't recognize it. And it was wrapped in paper and plastic, and I thought, well, what, what did I buy? <laughs> and I was, so I was really curious because I, I couldn't tell what it was. And so I cracked the bag, cracked the paper, just on the ones. I wanted to keep everything else nice. And it was 100% Cab Franc. And then mm -hmm. I thought for a minute, I'm like, huh, where was I what I would have thought about buying a case of Cab Franc? And so then I went and looked at the box, and guess what? It wasn't mine. So oh. <laughs> I repacked it and immediately went to the shipping and receiving, and we uh, we took care of it. So. Oh my gosh, too funny! Okay, so anyway. I want to hear from Danielle though. So, Cheers, what does your family typically have for Christmas dinner? Cheers. Cheers. We Cheers do dinner. a um, prime rib. You do? Yeah. My mom would cook it uh, like starting in early afternoon, and we do some veg vegetables like green beans, some mashed potatoes. Nice. Yeah. So very similar to Scott's family. Yes. Yeah. Or so the the. Um, Excuse me, the last two wines today are going to go well with both of your your holiday meals, and so okay. we'll get to that. Um, but what about you, Paula? So you're less on the meat side. I know that. I know. So I have not had meat of any kind in over 20 years, personal choice. So uh, smells great, looks beautiful, just not something that I choose to consume. So I'm always on the seafood side. So any t if I'm not hosting, if I'm going somewhere – it's usually like, hey, well, why don't you bring your seafood dish? <laughs> because otherwise, there's no main dish yes. for me. Yeah. So I do it for both Thanksgiving and Christmas. I uh, make homemade pasta, like angel hair style, and then a sauce that's made from pureed butternut squash, um, vegetable stock, garlic. And then I'm now using uh, dairy-free almond ricotta. It makes almost like a butternut Alfredo sauce. And then I put shrimp in it. So it's the butternut squash shrimp dish in my household. Wow, wow that, that sounds, sounds wonderful. Yeah. That sounds lovely. Can you tell I'm Italian? <laughs> <laughs> now, you, um, you're typically not a white wine drinker, are you? I am not. Um, and the only white wine that I really enjoy is Rombauer, of course. Okay. All but right. no, I don't do white wine. So. But actually, Rombauer with the, the big oaky, buttery wood, I'm sure is would be delicious with your seafood extravaganza. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, it absolutely is. Well. So a little bit more about what we're drinking today. As I mentioned, it's about 90% um, with the Pinot Noir, which gives us this beautiful rose color. Um, there's kind of flavors in essence of raspberry and strawberry, um, still dry. And in the kind of the order of what we're drinking today, um, most of my listeners know um, bubbles or champagne are one of my favorites, a great go-to uh, something that on rare, rare occasion, you can start early in, <laughs> in the day, like maybe brunch, <laughs> like on Christmas when you're opening <laughs> presents. It's happened uh, maybe a few years um, and kind of roll in through the day. <laughs> if you catch my drift. I'm going to uh, text you at 10 a.m. and say, how was your rosé? <laughs> Um, but another thing that's worth noting, for those who are ever having issues of pairing food, um, both this, what we're drinking now, more so in the brute than the rosé, and then what we're going to get into next, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, alleviate, 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 I'm sorry, the suspense, we're going to a Riesling, a dry Riesling. Again, mm. I didn't do my normal Chardonnay. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So we'll talk about that. But these two wines are the easiest pairing of pretty much any wine in the food group. So let's say we have listeners who like wine, but they just, it's simply that. They enjoy wine. They don't know much about it. Let's say they're hosting four people this year. What is a fail safe with a seafood dish and a meat dish? Like if you just had something where you could say, no matter what you pair, this will taste good. What would that be? Um, great question, and I can't answer with one. Do you want just one, or do you want? How about two? Okay, two. Whew. 
Okay, so I would have gone three. Because, <laughs> uh, again, I would go champagne across the board. Okay. You could do that. There's, let's just, just assume that's always a standard. So we'll take champagne out. Got it. All right, so I have two, two, two more. left. Okay. Um, I go to my Pinot Noir. Okay. Because I, I, I feel, and I'm very comfortable in having it with chicken, you know, a roasted chicken, chicken maybe with a, a marinara sauce or, or anything along those lines. Um, and then for the white, I would really – it's either going to be a very l- light oaked or no oaked Chardonnay. So I'm going to go into three. So it's either a Chardonnay, which could be technically a Chablis because that's a Chardonnay grape. Okay. Um, or the Riesling that we're going to have next. All right. All right. I'm mm. going to finish it up. Pinot Noir or Riesling. Those are the two fail safes. It's important to know because a lot of people sweat over these details. They're wanting to make yeah. a good impression and they don't have time to research. Right. Right. Those are the fail safes. You can, especially if you get a more full-bodied Pinot Noir that we discussed, um, if you're having the red meat or the bigger red meat, you can pull it off, eat, I think, very comfortably, and it's great. Um, but it also works. It can work for fish dishes. But if you're going to go the two, I would do the – this is, would go great. The reason would go great with your um, holiday. I can't remember the last time I had a Riesling, so oh, this is going to be interesting. Perfect. <laughs> What about like a, because I was going to say the other holiday dish that my wife and mother-in-law just love would be lasagna. Oh, lasagna is good Just a no good lasagna what. on Christmas, you know, they, 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 whether that's Christmas Eve or Christmas dinner, they love that. Mm. Uh, um, actually, our Christmas Eve is lasagna or pasta and meatballs, which my sister-in-law, who is Italian heritage, so she goes all out, all from scratch, grandma's recipe. Mm. Favorite night of the year. I'm sure it's food so wise good. and company and family. Um, mm. So, uh, I think a cab, your cab franc. What I try to do though, when I'm in, in that kind of regional um, eating, is to bring a regional wine. So something Italian. Um, mm. If you're the cab cab franc guy like you are, a Barolo is probably right. your oh. call. Um, I will super tell you, Tuscan. Super Tuscan is probably my favorite because it's a blend, and so it's it's not quite as big, not as bold. Um, right. It actually introduces some cab in the in the Super Tuscan. Um, Italy, in the the scheme of the grand scheme of the Sommelier test, that's every Psalm's Achilles' heel because every single little town it seems has its own wines. Um, and to, to know the whole country is almost like comparable to knowing the world because there's so many wines. Wow. But, you know, the bigger ones are the Barolo, the Super Tuscan. Um. And that was going to be another question of mine, too, is because obviously many people have a general knowledge of domestic wines, mostly Napa, Napa Valley, like things of that nature. And so there's this uneasiness, if you will, of, well, if, OK, I know enough that maybe I could go the route of Italian. But what are some good practices of if I'm going into a store or I'm looking online or what have you to say, OK, you know, this is this is a super Tuscan I could buy or Barolo or what have you. How do we guide some of the audience to be equipped? That's such a good point. You know, th- that's going to take um, a little. Is that a show unto its own? That's a little time and a little skill. <laughs> I, to, to, but to answer what I would do if I went in with no knowledge is go into a store like a, a big pavilions that has a sommelier on staff, mm-hmm. go to a high times, go somewhere that have people with knowledge, and then just ask them. They, uh, I love nothing more than to answer questions about it mm-hmm. just because I have a passion for it. And these people who work, I don't even work in it, but people who work in it um, even more so. So that would be my answer to that. Um, and then you know, secondarily, uh, Dr. Google is pretty helpful also. <laughs> Yeah. What did we do before Google, right? Gosh. I don't know how we survived. It was rough. We, no. We're not sure. <laughs> what are you thinking? Oh, I, I think it's delicious. Do you drink rosé champagne ever? Or? I do on occasion, yes. Yeah, you're more of the brute, I think. I am more of the brute. I was a Prosecco fan for years. I moved oh. on from that. I know Prosecco is one of your least favorite, if not uh, your absolute least favorite. In the sparkling world. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm definitely more of a brute person now. So why don't you share with everyone what a Prosecco is? Uh, so Prosecco is sparkling wine. It's I used to really enjoy the taste because I felt like it was a bit sweeter mm-hmm. than champagne. 
And I think my taste buds just changed over time. Now I don't, I don't enjoy the sweetness that often comes with that. So that's exactly right. And I think that does happen, myself included. My, I've, your, your taste buds, I think, change, mature over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and your description was great. Prosecco definitely is sweeter. Um, it is made in, in Italy, so that's mm-hmm. the Italian sparkling wine, not in the method Champenois. So it's, it's a different, um, I guess, manufacturing method than Champagne, but mm-hmm. um, for some, um, really good. And if you want a great recommendation for Prosecco, La Marca makes a great one. So <laughs> Very popular. <laughs> what do you think of this, Danielle? It's really good. Yeah. I usually prefer a more dry brute Champagne, but this is really nice. It's different, right? Yeah. A little, a little sweet, but not too sweet. Slight, I think just one notch up from, from the brute, but yeah. not too bad. That's yeah, very nice. I have a Zinfandel question for you, but I'll ask that when we get into the reds. Okay. All right. Speaking of the big red meats. Okay. Um, shall we move on? We'll move on. All right. We need new glasses. Here we go. Um, All right. Th- this one? So we're doing the whites and the stems. Got it. All right. So wine is one thing, and then glassware is a whole other thing with controversy and uh, perfectionism and um, and then just personal preference. So, okay, Scott, what's your go-to stemware? The go-to what? Go-to stemware. I already know what Bart's go-to <laughs> stemware is, so I'm not going to ask that question. Mm-hmm. I already know. So this is where I have a lot to learn from Bart. And that we are not good with the stemware category, and we could der- certainly do do a better part. Okay, Bart. Now it's time to share your favorite stemware. So my favorite stemware is uh, Riedel, and then it's varietal specific. So Riedel has come out with lines of glasses that are specific per your varietal. Meaning, if you're drinking a, sh- uh, a white Burgundy or a Chardonnay, here's the glass. If you're drinking a red Burgundy or a Pinot Noir. Here's the glass, a cab, here's the glass. And they have the full gamut. So the problem with that when you're OCD, which I may or may not be, (laughs) is then you have a a display and a closet full of all of these different glasses. Um, And a pet peeve is when Tina tries so hard, like occasionally, like, honey, I'm just going to get you a glass of wine. (laughs) And then she brings that in the wrong glass, and then so then I'm faced with as a husband, do I do I do I drink the wine in the improper glass and and just pretend that it doesn't bother me, or do I tell her, or do like when she turns her back, do I go and switch it, which is what I often do. Well, you know while. what I think is really funny about that? I bet she already knows. It's just a, <laughs> one little way to mess with you. Go, <laughs> Tina. So we are drinking the uh, Riesling, which by the way, it's a 2017 Riesling from. Fess Parker. So if anyone recognizes that name, um, he was very famous back in the, I believe it's the early as the 50s or 60s. Do you even know who I'm talking about? Are you old enough? Well. He's an actor. Daniel Boone? Okay, I know the name. I wasn't Uh. around back then, but I do know the name. Do you know the name Daniel Boone? Yes, for sure. Okay. Danielle? I do not. Do you know the name Daniel Boone? No. No picking on the ladies. Uh, Scott? <laughs> Daniel Boone. TV show? Oh, oh you're on your oh, own. Bart. You're on your own. I, yeah, I don't, Scott I don't know. Scott usually knows all of them. It was like old school Disney. Daniel Boone was a man, was a big man. Had a coonskin hat. For the, for the record, in three years of never podcasting, you have singing. never, <laughs> ever broke into song. This is good. <laughs> it's like half glass of champagne. You don't ever want to I think he's it. very happy to be in the new studio. I'm going to attribute it to that. That's like Dave. You're talking about like. Like Davy Crockett. Crockett or something. Yeah, it's, it's the same. Yeah. Anywho, um, Fess Parker was the actor. Let me look that up. Let me look that yeah, up. He was the uh, He was the actor. Very very family friendly show um, and his family got into wine as a Hollywood person he I think he was the financial backing and it's a it's a great in my opinion one one of the better wines in the Santa Barbara County so any event mm. um, we're gonna talk about the stemless glass in a minute but try the Riesling mm. 
Oh, that's, I don't like your face on that, Paula. I, ha- a, I had to really, no I had to process. That's a no-go? So I don't do a lot of dairy, even though I, I love dairy, so sometimes I cheat. If I was going to cheat and pair this with a cheese, what would you put with this? A Gouda? Um, good one. I would do a Gouda. Okay. I, I would say it, uh, not too strong of a cheese. This is a, kind of going back to the um, earlier comment about day drinking, this is a wine that you can, um, well, my sommelier teacher told me, um, this is the wine he drinks during the day when he's thinking about what wine he's going to have at night. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I <great>. love it. <laughs> um, Riesling, most people, what do you think? The first thing that comes to your mind when you have Riesling, what do you think? It's very sweet, and it reminds me of something I would drink if I was on a boat. Okay. So do you think, do you feel that this one is sweet? I think it's very sweet. To you me, do? this was really? very sugary sweet. I didn't think so. So this is this is dry. <laughs> Well, <laughs> these buds are off. There you have it. <laughs> so Riesling is, is primarily known for being sweet for some reason, right? But at the the reality is there's six categories. And number six, I'm, I'm going to leave out the, the German names of them all. Um, but the most, number six, the highest is very, very sweet, more dessert wine. And then number one, we're probably at a number two on the dry level. It reminds me of something I, I used to really enjoy when I was in my Prosecco phase, but it's sparkling, and I'm going to say the name wrong, but I will try. It's Gerwurstdemeanor? Yes, you said, it, you said mm. it very nice. Yeah, you oh. said it nice. It's um, in the same category. Okay. And Gerwurstdemeanor, you probably said it better than I did, <laughs> um, also has levels of, of dry to sweet. Uh-huh. Um, it tends to be more on the sweet side. Mm-hmm. Um, are, you, are you getting sweet or dry? I'm getting dry. Okay. Kind of has a slight so. soury taste. Um, wow! So this was not a winner, folks. Do not <laughs> <laughs> do not choose me. Um, I I I do like it for a couple of reasons. Um, again, if you're on yourself, or hey, it's <coughs> early and I'm going to I'm going to drink. This is a lower alcohol, so it's something that you can drink and not ah. fall over by dinner time. Um, and again, it's super you. Does it feel like you could pair it with a lot? Paula? For me, it does. Okay, good. But, but I'm a seafood person, and so I feel like the majority of what I would eat, this would go with. Chicken, seafood, all the classics, right? The yeah. white meats, for sure. Um, salads. Mm-hmm. Um, I would go here. Now, this is personal personal preference. I would go here before I would do a Sauvignon Blanc. Really? Because I, that's, really? That's, I know, I know. I'm in the minority on the... I feel like Scott and, Scott and I need an explanation about that. I, you know, it's personal preference. I'm not a big fan of most Sauvignon Blancs. Um, mo- m- to me, most Sauvignon Blancs are a little bit too um, too green, too bell pepper, too fresh cut grass, which is really? not my thing. Um, unless it comes from France. Which is the- what, ma- you know, it's interesting. That makes sense. That's why New Zealand would make such good Sauvignon Blanc. There's nothing but grass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't do much and- white, but Rombauer's Sauvignon Blanc is... Oh my gosh! So actually, you know what? So I, good. I have had theirs, and it's actually pretty good. So delicious. I've had some in the Napa um, um, area that that I thought were okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Groth, G R O T H. Okay. I, I think those are that's okay. All right. I would never just go to it if it was if I was at a party and they were serving it. I would have it. Um, but if it was at a wine tasting meal, I would have it. But it's never my go to. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Another fact I need to note. Um, another fact you might note, so as we know, Northern California has Napa and Sonoma. Mm-hmm. So Napa is more of the Bordeaux um, varietals, which are Cab- Cabernet Sauvignon and um, Sauvignon Blanc. And then Sonoma is going to be your more Burgundy, which are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Ah, I see. Okay. So depending on which one you like, plan your trip accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know you can spend days up there and it's never enough. Yeah, so. Exactly. So, given the um, negative, <laughs> we're going to move on. <laughs> we're going to not say it was negative. It was education. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, but, but let me. So, our, our go-to white is a Savion Blanc in our household. How would you really compare this to a Riesling to a Sav One Two? Um, I've heard that Riesling goes well with Chinese food. Oh. So. Um, probably, yes, it does go well with Chinese food or with Thai food, uh, maybe even because where, it where this is the, non- the spice, I guess, a little bit. 
Correct. Yeah, uh, you want to kind of offset the spice. So I would probably bring up the the notch if we're number two, maybe to the number three on the Riesling level. Um, okay. So Rieslings are um, primarily either in the north of France or in Germany. And so each country has their different names for the different levels, um, which is a whole education process in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is definitely a uh, – it's – to me, it's night and day from Sauvignon Blanc. So if you love Sauvignon Blanc, you may not love this. Um, mm-hmm. Or you might appreciate it for what it is. Different. Right. Okay. <laughs> I was wanting today just to show different wines. I've got so. you, Scott. I'm in the Sauv family with you, for sure. Yep. yep. <laughs> Let's live. Live on. <laughs> Go on. Um, the last thing I'll say about the glasses. So um, does anyone know the origination of the uh, stemless, which we're drinking out of right now? I feel like I've read this before, but I, it's not top of mind. So you have to share it with us. All right. So uh, Riedel glasses have been around for several generations and uh, could be generation three, I think, where uh, working in New York, selling glasses. I might have actually shared this story, which is why. You it's know. coming back. Yes. <laughs> so he's in his, again, he's generation three or four, not really up on the, on the food chain yet, living in a small apartment in somewhere in New York. Um, has glasses, Riedel glasses, goes to put them in the cabinet and realizes my wine glasses don't fit in <laughs> the shelving in my apartment. So um, somewhat geniusly uh, decides, well, the, the bowl is nice. What if, what if? And so he somehow created the, uh, like, what if we just cut the stems off? So there you have it. Well, what I love, <laughs> what I love about that and tying it into our COVID world is where there is a will, there is a way. You just learn to make things work. Yeah, that's so, for sure. Exactly. Um, and I think they are, um, you know, at times, I think they're they're fun, um, like more in daytime or pool time. Um, but the problem that I have with them is, you know, wine, if you get back to back to the OCD area, um, it's certain temperatures, right? White wine is supposed to be chilled and red wine, um, um, you know, cool but not but not warm well there's no way to not palm a glass i mean you could kind of come up here ah. uh, to which case then you're using your body temperature to change the temperature of the wine i hadn't thought about that you're right it's things that keep me up at night <laughs> struggle is real <laughs> oh to be a psalm all right let's move to these beautiful large red wine glasses you had me at Austin Hope, which is I'm, not oh, yet. Which is not yet. We're going to finish with that. <laughs> so, um, as you saw earlier, when I tried to get this to breathe, all right, good. Not an issue with me breaking the cork. Nobody saw it. It doesn't matter. Part of the issue. This is a 2008, so we've oh. got a little bit of age. Nothing but the best for y'all. I like the color of this. Can you tell by the color what it is, Paula? Can you see the color, Scott? Looks beautiful. Pretty dark, right? I, it is pretty dark. It's super rich, I can tell. Before I tell you what it is, it's um, the fact that the cork yeah, So you've broke. not announced it yet, right? No, because the cork broke, so I want to make sure that's good before. <laughs> Okay, judging by that face, okay. it's safe. So this is an etude from Napa Valley, a GBR, which is their Grace Benoit Ranch. Now, etude is really, really popular for their Pinot Noirs, which I am a huge fan of. But then someone introduced me to this, and it's been in my cell for quite some time. So when I was actually at the cellar unloading the eight cases, I <laughs> came upon, upon this case and realized that, oh, I better, we need to drink this. Um, it is a blend. It is 85%, wait for it, Merlot. That's, mm. I can taste that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. And then 15% Malbec. Mm. So it's an interesting blend. Wow. Um, now, let's talk about Merlot. Merlot, that poor grape that has been so um, underappreciated <laughs> for how long has that movie been out? 
20, uh, oh, yeah. 15, 20 years? Mm -hmm, something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. it has to be. Pa Paul Giamatti did that one in. One of my favorite <laughs> actors. Um, <clears throat> now, But I think that Merlot, again, one of the most underappreciated and one of my favorites, if, if I'm given a choice with um, a big prime rib, big steak dinner, and I have a good Merlot or a good cab, I would often go to the Merlot. Um, I think it has, I like the, the flavor components. I like the fact that it's not quite, the tannins aren't quite as big. I'm not big on, on big tannins, um, but enough to um, compete with and help with the, the red meat. Um, there is such, the controversy is real, but not, not um, worthy. The reason, so if for anyone who's watched the movie, the reason that Merlot got such a bad rap is because he says, you know, I hate Merlot. And then that just destroyed the whole region and destroyed the varietal. But sadly, if you read the book, what, the reason he hates Merlot is because Paul Giamatti's um, girlfriend or wife in the movie, now I forgot, um, she loved Merlot. So the whole reason he didn't like it wasn't that he didn't like the grape. It's because his wife didn't. It like was it. because of a because woman. His wife it's liked always it. the significant it's always other. The woman. Always. <laughs> a man scorned. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you? I liked. I love that you say that because one of our go-to reds that I've just we fell in love with as part of the Cardinal label up in Napa Valley. Chris Carpenter is the actual winemaker now, but they make two other labels: Lahoda and Mount Brave, and. They're of Howell Mountains, so they're made at elevation, yeah. but almost always, and they make phenomenal Merlots and Merlot blends. Um, it's just exquisite wines. You know, the longer, uh, you know, we were like three minutes in since I, we've poured this, and I opened it about a half hour ago, but this, this sip was even better than the one before. So I, I agree. Think decanting this would be, would be mm -hmm. amazing. Um, the color is deep and rich. Um, slight color uh, lightning on the rim, which means it has a little bit of age to it. Uh, ripe black cherry, a little bit of bl uh, obviously black fruit, a little bit of black licorice. I taste that. Yeah. So you mentioned decanting. I learned a fun fact, which I'm sure you and Scott both already know. That's But it. I ordered a new decanter that arrived a few days ago, and it had a note about washing it with water and white vinegar. I, mm -hmm. I didn't know what that was all about. So I did some Googling, speaking of Google, and I realized <laughs> that in doing so, the soap leaves certain like residues and scents in the decanter that you don't get out. So they say to wash it with white, uh, water and white vinegar. Is that true? Um, not only for your the decanter, but for your glasses. I never use soap on my glasses. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Note yeah. to self. And fun fact, you can use white vinegar as your fabric um, softener in your instead of commercial oh, fabric softener. Really? Mm -hmm. I'm learning a lot yeah, today. I'm learning all the things. Yeah. Wow. With age comes wisdom. Thank goodness. <laughs> Bart, Bart, how, do you, Bart, how do you wash your glasses then? Um, warm water, sponge, and if necessary, I'll throw some vinegar in. But usually, that's just a, that's plenty. Okay. And I dry them off with a lint-free like microfiber. Uh -huh. Mm. You guys did. A, I mean, these glasses look amazing. So you guys Thank did a good you. job. Of, was, was that you, me. Danielle? Me. Wow. Go, Danielle. <laughs> wow. Are you getting hints of anything else in there? The licorice for me is really strong, but I like that. How about espresso or coffee? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, espresso for I sure. I can see a little bit of that, or taste a little bit of that. Could you see this with your with your your big? Christmas dinner, your steak dinner? Yeah, your prime rib? Yeah. yeah. That would be yummy. Yeah, I think so too. I have a red Zin question. Can I Let's insert that. that now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so outside of Pinot, I've become a huge fan of red Zinfandel. And one of my absolute favorites <clears throat> that can be very challenging to get is Turley. Oh, which, yeah. you know, at yeah. 230 Forest in Laguna, a great local restaurant, yeah. they usually have it. It's, I mean, it's almost impossible to order from any place. I, I did just find one place that I did thankfully just get a case from, Bounty Hunter. If anybody oh, wants yeah. to order from there, they had some. Yeah. But why is it that, I mean, there's a waiting list that's like two years long to get this stuff. That Just that particular yes. um, winemaker? Yeah. Um, I honestly haven't heard, so. It's crazy. I don't know what the deal is. What region, to, what, um, where does he make his wine? Where do the grapes come from? Mm, I know it's up north somewhere. Paso? Paso is big in It might be Zinfandel. Paso. Okay. 
I mean, you cannot find it. I mean, so over the years, I think over the last 10 years, Zinn has become um, more and more popular. So there, I think there's more and mm. more vineyards. Um, we've had fires. So maybe one of ah. the regions were affected by the fires. Interesting. Paso, I don't think that Paso has been fire. Um, it's yeah, just amazing don't, don't to me. It has good. like this cult following where, I mean, you have to be on a waiting list to get anything from Turley directly. Yeah. Most places like Total Wines sell out. I know some of the restaurants, you know, they get direct, so orders are placed in advance, but it's a mystery. I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. Well, like Scott and I are on the William Salem, there many winemakers have just limited if if it's single vineyard, um, by the name represents there's it, mm -hmm. it just comes from one vineyard. There's there's a finite number of uh, vines, finite number of grapes, mm -hmm. so it could be something to do with that. Note to self, note to Turley, please make more of your red Zinfandel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scott, wish you were tasting this with us, Scott. Oh, gosh, I wish I... Yep, you'll right. have to save some for me. I'm going to save a bottle of this for you for your uh, Christmas dinner, though. I think um, mm. given what you guys eat, it would be great. Cheers to you. <laughs> All right, that leaves us with one left. But we have wine in our glass and no dumping bucket. So that means we just we have need to, to drink up. talk and drink. Okay, so I have a question for Scott. So um, celebration-wise for New Year's, are there different dishes that you guys make for New Year's to celebrate or different dishes that you'll make this year? So with that, <clears throat> my wife's family and certainly my mother-in-law, she is a fantastic baker. Oh, so um, nice. And so they have a tendency, my grandmother-in-law, certainly a sweet tooth, great mom, we call her, is like the sweet, the sweetest tooth of them all. Um, so with that said, there's always a few desserts that we would kick off with, with New Year's. And so something that would pair more, certainly champagne, um, Blanc de Blanc, we love. Nice. With those, with the dessert, yep. Um, and... Um, Usually a milder red, so there's where we would tend to open up some of those pinots. My wife Melissa loves Pinot Noir, so I'll always save a few of those little William Sillium gems. Or we found a little winery, just the two of us, when we were on our 10-year anniversary, actually, in um, in Sonoma, Papietro Perry Winery, family-owned winery. They make some great pinots, so we'll open up those from time to time as well. Nice. What about you, Bart? What do you guys do for New Year's? Or what will you do this year? Yeah, so every year seems to, is a bit different. This year, I'm sure we'll be home. With I'm pretty sure you will be. <laughs> um, I, th there will be bubbles involved. and That will probably be most of my spirits for the day. Don't know what we're eating. <laughs> Don't know if any family's coming over. But that would be pretty typical. I, if it's if I'm lucky, I will stay up till nine o'clock, which is East Coast um, New Year's, and then I feel <laughs> like I've achieved the whole New you Year. You made it. You made it. <laughs> yeah. You'll be asleep uh, on the couch at nine o five. Tehani will be on top of you, asleep thirty minutes prior, and Tina will put you all to bed. So you're pretty close. So I probably <laughs> fall asleep at eight thirty. She'll be dancing across my chest until. <laughs> 10 o'clock oh, no. and then Tina will pick us, you know, drag me into bed at some point. Life with the toddler. Yeah. All right, Danielle, what about you? Yeah. The youngster, do you, is it party time or? For me, no. <laughs> I mean, I will stay up till midnight, but wow. I'll have some champagne. Mm -hmm. Nothing too crazy though. Yeah, you, Danielle comes from a large family, so she has... You know, I all have. the siblings and family gatherings. So that's so yeah, cool. just when her immediate family gets huge. together, it's a party. Yeah, I that's have great. Four Shh. sisters, one brother. Oh my gosh, four sisters. Yeah. Where are you in the order of the four? So I'm the second oldest. Okay. So it goes four girls, boy, and then one more girl. That boy must be incredible because he had four women around him yeah, raising oh. him. Yeah. Five, including mom. I bet. But he is so spoiled. Oh, I'm sure. By my parents and all his siblings. <laughs> but yeah, just when we all get together for Christmas or New Year's, it's always just a party because so there's so many people. How fun. Oh, yeah. that's so great. How fun. 
And Paula, what will you be doing for New Year's this year? Well, as we all know, this year has been very different. So usually there's lots of parties and yeah. cocktail hours that I need to go to. I'll probably be at home with my two dogs. Two dogs. <laughs> Both are Siberian Huskies. One is a senior. She's 13. One is a terrorist. Toddler, He's a uh, year and a half. Don't ask me why I got a young male husky. Not sure, but he is super handsome and so loving. So I'm sure I'll be tired asleep by 1030 and we'll wake up in a new year. So right. that's it. All right. Not exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. a crazy year, different year for all, for us all, for sure. Mm -hmm. But looking forward to 2021. Let me tell you, 2021 better bring with it some key differences from 2020. I think there was a lot of great things about this year. Oh, for sure. I mean, a laundry list, actually. But That's another show. That's actually a great show. Just it is. Great things of 2020. Right? The silver I mean, linings of yes. 2020. Yeah. There's so many. But I think that a lot of us would just, now that we have a newfound appreciation for, I don't know, dining out, concerts, things like that, travel, that we'd like to just do them again. Yeah. So. How nice. Novel concept crazy all right like i've never had on the topic of food and wine i've never had more family dinners at the table in this house than in 2020 i believe that completely are you do you find yourself doing more cooking or more takeout in the words of my wife melissa yesterday i have never cooked more in my <laughs> life than this year combined <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm the okay. breakfast guy and barbecue. So anything that has to do with the barbecue or what have you, I'm all about it. Uh, breakfast, fantastic at that. So it, it is a little bit of a team effort, thank goodness. Uh, but still tons of cooking in the midst of all this. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Great things mm -hmm. happen over dinner table conversations. And I think one little silver lining has been we've spent more time with loved ones breaking bread than we usually do. And that's a, a gift. I'm sure you can speak to that, especially with little ones. Mm hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Nerve wracking at times. Oh, yeah. Uh, but but count, look, count your blessings and and um, look for the silver lining and things. Always. Right. hundred percent. hundred percent. Now, what did you just pour us? You have poured us a new glass of something. I sure did. So first of all, what do you think of the color? It's my favorite so far. It's favorite. <laughs> way darker than the previous. Deep, dark, right? Um, blackberry. It's a, a dark, like a black red almost. Mm -hmm. Smells sweeter. Yeah. And so, Danielle, if you swirl it around, look at the, the rim compared to the last glass of wine. You notice how the rim is is not as distinctively different. I mean, it's lighter, but not as distinctively lighter as the like, less. It leaves a thicker coat. So uh, that's true, uh, which is another thing, but just around the edge here. Oh, okay. On the last glass of wine, it was like super light, because, and that means that it's been aged. This one is a 2018, so it's only two years old. The other one has been 12 years old. That's why the color difference isn't oh, as yeah, distinct. Stays, yeah, pretty similar yeah. throughout. Okay. And then the the legs as it referred to that talk, that actually references the um, the sugar the, alc um, the the basically the sugar and the and the, uh, the wine so the more the legs kind of the heavier um, the sugar residual sugar um, take a smell also really different right what are you smelling. I cheated. I, I took a taste instead of a smell. <laughs> it's very good. Did we tell listeners what this is yet? I feel Not like yet. we didn't. Not yet. Oh. I think we talked about it before we went on mm. or live. I'm waiting on bated breath here. <laughs> smells like a little more woodsy. I agree with Danielle. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. I like that. All right. So let me tell her what we're drinking. So this is um, a winemaker called, uh, named Austin Hope. They're out of Paso Robles. It's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, what mm. I love about it is, to me, it is a big, big Pinot Noir. It's, it's more a big, big Pinot Noir and less a cab. So when I was at a our club, Paul mm -hmm. and I belonged to a club, and this was first served to me, that was the first thing I thought it was. And when... Um, our 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 friend, the uh, club manager, brought it out. I thought, "Wow, this is 
it's it's a, a little bit deceiving mm-hmm. um, and very delicious. I wouldn't normally have a Cabernet Sauvignon just by itself without food because it's just not my taste. But this I'm enjoying very much right now. Mm-hmm. Again, it's, this is a full to me. It's a full, full, full body Pinot, but in reality, it's a Cabernet Sauvignon. So color is deep and dark. Um, the tannins are very well balanced. It's not like kind of in your face. You have to have food with. Uh, there's black cherry. There's caramel. In my opinion, a little bit of chocolate. It's amazing how a Psalm's trained nose can pick out <laughs> these I'm things. Like, Wait, chocolate? What? You get it? A little bit. A little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you think about it. So two questions. One, if you were doing a great cheese plate. What cheeses would you put with this? Number two, if you were pairing this with a meal, what would you put with it? So the meals that Scott and Danielle have, so the big roast red meats, Mm -hmm. I think this would go great. Okay. Um, I wouldn't do – we talked about earlier, Pinot Noir would go with chicken or with beef. To me, this doesn't go with chicken. It's too big for that. Uh, But definitely with the big grilled meats, Um, even like a grilled like pork loin, I think it would go well with. Okay. Uh, mushrooms, Brussels sprouts, mm-hmm. that I think all kind of falls in this category. Um, cheeses, a cheese that I don't care for. And I have uh, some specifics that I like and don't like. I don't care for blue cheese, <sighs> but I think this would go great with blue cheese. It would probably make me like blue cheese. I <laughs> love a good blue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you go, girl. You and you guys are getting along cheese. great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Blue yeah. gorgonzola, yeah, absolutely. Have to go to dinner together. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> so I'm the goat, the gouda, the cheddar. That's that's more my, okay. my style. Um, but that's now, the- just to challenge it a little bit for a moment, what about if I had like a really smoked chicken, you know, from a smoker, and so it was it was really a heavy, smoky flavored chicken, or would that still be like a pinot? You know, at the end of the day, it's personal preference. It pr- it probably would work. I think the wine we had before, the Merlot blend, would be better with that chicken. I think a big uh, Pinot Noir, your Willem Salem, your your one of our New Zealand uh, favorites, would go better with that chicken. But you could pull this off with that sort of a chicken. Yeah. Okay. So the Merlot, the Etude, or something like that, would be a better. I think so. Yeah, I agree. Good stuff. I like this one way better than the previous one. Oh, you do? Mm-hmm. Okay. So that means you have your taste is more for the bigger, fuller bodied. What do you normally drink, Danielle? Like, what's your go to wine? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. <laughs> she doesn't have I'll do, yeah, I'll do <laughs> whatever. Seltzers. Okay. I, uh, this is like my first like learning about wine. <laughs> I've never been wine tasting, <gasps> except for the party we did at Scott's. Oh, okay. Like, May of last year. Yeah, last year. Yeah. Right. I think that the the first Zanbergen group retreat should include Danielle, and it should be in Napa. I um, I like it. Yeah, that would be nice. So, like oh, it. and yeah. Scott. Scott, yes, you need to Scott come. Scott and Danielle. <laughs> it's a given. <laughs> it's like, what about me? You can me? do that. So with um, holidays coming right upon us, um, we already talked about, kind of we fast forwarded to New Year's. What are you doing for Christmas, Paula? So I'll be with my family. So mom and stepdad, who have been together forever, um, still live in Lake Arrowhead in the same house I grew up in. And so if we're lucky, I might have snow, which is always fun. Um, I don't know. There's something about being in a colder climate with snow that's just sort of magical for Christmas. So that's always my go-to. I had tried to get out of it, to be honest, this year, because I was (laughs) just up there. And my mom looked at me like, I'm sorry, what did you say? So I will be up in Lake Arrowhead for <laughs> Christmas, hands down. What okay. about you? I think that's wonderful. So as far as I know, we're going to continue with our normal protocol, which is sister-in-laws with the pasta dinner and all. Uh, Delicious. So great. And then Christmas Day is at our house, starting with probably something like this. The, Just a little Nikki the Nikki F. F. <laughs> uh, and then we'll see how it goes. And then we do a brunch, and Tina and I were talking about it. Um, and it's varied. We've done um, the turkey, which mm-hmm. kind of is my go-to. Not that I am a creature of habit or anything, but that's mm-hmm. um, um, kind of my thing. What we talked about this year, maybe doing lamb, uh, maybe doing something in the red meat. Um, nice. I talked about maybe a, like a big filet mignon or a tri-tip. 
So we'll see. And then we just kind of just graze during the day. I love it. One thing I will give a plug to, you know, it's so important to support local. So Christmas Eve, I will be at home. And if you're listening to this, order local, support your local restaurants. I know for me, there's so many great places, Marche Modern, True Food, depending upon what, you know, your style is. All the great local restaurants are doing amazing take home Christmas Eve and Christmas dinner. So try to support local. I'll be doing it. No cooking for me Christmas (laughs) Eve. It's funny you should say that because Tina has been so um, taken control of the build out of our office with mm-hmm. you know the company. Um, so I actually suggested that like, honey, there are so many great restaurants like packaging our clubs. So, I mean, all the restaurants in Laguna, right? Um, and so maybe um, Oak is one of my favorites, and my friend owns mm-hmm. Solanes is one of my favorite. Um, the Center Club. So we'll see. Scott, what about you? What are you <clears throat> up to? Christmas Eve and Christmas so, Day. <clears throat> we will be home for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Uh, Bart's familiar with the saga a little bit of my mother-in-law. She'll be coming home from New Zealand in a few days. Oh. And so she'll be, she'll long journey home. It's been long drawn out, but she'll be with us. And then we'll head up to her place in Lake Tahoe on the 27th through New Year. So we'll get the wintry, hopefully white snow for the New Year's and all that. And the kids just love that. And we do too. It's a great time that we can just disconnect and kind of re- refocus, recalibrate, and recharge. It's a wonderful few days. So fun. Oh my gosh. That yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah, that does sound great. Yeah. Danielle, looking forward to that. What is your game plan? We need so, to know. I will be with my family. My mom will cook something, maybe Italian, maybe Indian on New mm. Year's Eve. And then Christmas, yeah, we'll do kind of grazing. It's, we have our first, my first nephew, so first grandchild, Aww. so it's first Christmas, so we'll all be together and then do like a prime rib. That's such like a that. special yeah. time. Wow. So a special, little one. Yeah. How old will he be? He will be Christmas. He'll be nine months. Oh, yeah. so cute. So the firstborn of your clan. Yeah, first, like, so yeah, of wow. all my siblings, first child. Whoa. So precious. Not spoiled. No, not spoiled at, not all. at all. No. At all. So His I, Christmas list was out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> I have an Indian food question for you. If you yes. could have one Indian dish, oh. which is hard. I really love Indian food. Mm-hmm. What is it? What's your go-to? Okay, so I am not much of a foodie. So I would do tandoori chicken. Mm. That's been like marinated for hours. Oh. Okay, yeah. Maybe some chicken tikka masala. Mm. And... Usually, we just actually got Indian food out, but my mom makes it so much better. And my uh, mom is not Indian, but she just took kind of took over my mother or my grandmother's recipes. Wow. So, she so makes, good. She makes a good um, doll. A so, good that's my paneer. favorite. I love and doll and yeah. I love paneer. And I, when I, I'm like, oh, I don't really like those, but they actually taste so good and so much better than getting it food out. So, wow. so, so wow. much better. I yeah. mean, I'm coming to your house. I would have said, <laughs> for Indian uh, food, Indian I, would have said, I would have said Riesling for your Indian <laughs> food, but no one liked my Riesling, so forget that. Um, I have a little funny story before we close up. So um, I, I did a little bit of Christmas shopping. I was at Costco, and we're trying to do things that are more, um, less toys, more like arts and crafts and so forth. Oh, so good. there was something that I saw. Um, I was shopping by myself, which is so much better than having <laughs> like a crew with me. Anyway, it was like no one could see me, but it was it was literally this big. It was an arts and crafts with crayons and markers and and thing. It was frozen theme at Costco, Aww. so I thought this is perfect because we don't. Again, the th- the, our our goal was not to overwhelm with toys and things, but things that she could do. I got it home. This was actually last night. Put it in the garage, and I hit it. Right next to my, actually my wine, <laughs> my wine refrigerator. It's because it's I, I know I use my arms. It's about two and a half feet wide, five feet tall, and about maybe two inches thick. So I just set it perfectly, and then put up. We have like our dining table extensions there. Mm-hmm. So I had to say like, there's no way she's ever going to see this. It's so huge. I can't even put it in the closet. I can't put it anywhere. So. You know, this is all work at home days, and a um, uh, um, guy that cleans my cars came by today, and his name is Paul, and Tehani loves Paul. Paul's here. Paul's here. So she's out playing with Paul, and I'm getting ready to actually leave for some appointments today. And next thing you know, Paul and his his 
his assistant coming in, and they're holding said thing. And Tehani's like, look at what my papa got me. Look at what my papa got oh, me. Like, no, no. What? How? <laughs> oh, my God. You were, papa, you're so great. I'm like, no. Oh, wait, no. 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 That's that is Santa. a total fail. Uh-oh. Santa, you need to hide better I next year. I am a terrible Santa. <laughs> you got to keep presents here. That's what... So in other words, yeah. you haven't started your Christmas shopping yet. Apparently, I'm starting over. <laughs> <laughs> you should never underestimate a toddler, especially one named Tehani. If you haven't met her, genius. How old she's, is she, Bart? She's five. She's the equivalent of her terrorist dog. Oh, f- no, she's five going on like 37. It's, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> oh, so I actually have... Um, a question for everybody here to close out the show. Okay. I know. So everybody who listens, we have an, we have a final thought question, which ah. typically is your ultimate lesson learned. Yeah. So I want to do a different spin on that, and I'll start with you, Bart. Um, this year, I think forever, <laughs> forever, as long as we live, will be remembered as a game-changing year, whether we like it or not, good or bad. I'm wondering this year, what has been your ultimate lesson learned this year in 2020? Mm. You know, the first thing that pops in my mind is lemonades out of lemon. Mm. It's, you know, your Delta deck of cards. It's your, it's what you do with it that counts, Mm -hmm. right? We're all dealt something in our lives, whether it's this year, the pandemic, we're all or different parts of our life as, you know, o- over the years, but how you react and what you do with it. So true. Scott, what are your sentiments? What's your ultimate lesson learned here in 2020? Something Melissa and I <clears throat> have talked recently about, but a book we've read a few years back that and it's called fill your bucket. Mm-hmm. And identifying for us just recognizing people in your life who fill your bucket and that time is so precious time is so scarce make the most of it and make sure you value and are surrounding your t- your time with people that don't drain your bucket we all have those people right so um, true it's just too fragile it time is. is too fragile danielle great, great one scott that was good, Scott. I would say kind of similar to Scott and Bart's, but also just kind of focusing on myself. I've taken this year to more so I've always been like giving to so many different people. So kind of taking back and saying, okay, what do I need? What do I want to focus on? And kind of having more time to do that has been huge and really beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Self-care is so important. Yeah. Self-care, but also like not in the self-care that you think of like, oh, I'm going to go to a spa day or that type of thing. Right. But just like little things like right. writing in a journal or right. tell my, telling myself, okay, I'm going to work out on this day. And it's, and holding yourself accountable yeah, to yeah, it. Making yourself accountable, which is still kind of a work in progress. But Which, by the way, Danielle, over the years that I've known you, you are, you are the giver personality. Yes. Um, which is awesome. And so I'm glad that you're taking some time to um, give to yourself. Yeah, learning how to say no more. Great. Good for you. Yep. Say no to Scott. <laughs> He's like, no, don't say no to me. Don't do that. Uh-huh. Just kidding, Scott. So for Paula, wait, wait. I know you are, Paula. kind of. I know you are, but kind of. Don't think you're going to get out of that question, Paul. No. <laughs> so, so for me, it's, it, it's honestly just reaffirmed the slogan for my company, which is because life is not a dress rehearsal. You know, the Buddha says that the problem is we think we have time. We This year has shown us we don't necessarily have time and anything can change on a dime. And so I think just for me in my life personally and professionally, just continuing to be very intentional about the decisions I make and holding myself accountable for those decisions. Um, when you're in PR, it's real easy to spin yourself a story. And so <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be better about not spinning my story and um, holding myself more accountable this year. So I like it. Yeah. All right. So some good from the bad. Absolutely. Without right. a doubt. There's always good from the bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Scott, any closing words before we close up? 
another spectacular wine <laughs> adventure. I, I commend you for stepping outside of your bounds of what your comfort zone would normally be with wine. Thanks for having us. Hope you enjoyed it. And we're going to cheers. Cheers, Danielle. Cheers, cheers, Bart. Cheers, Scott. Yeah. Cheers to the final episode of the Zanbergen Report in 2020. Yeah, the final for the year. And I want to thank both Danielle and Scott for allowing us to, um, for hosting us in your wonderful studio. Look forward to many, many more shows to come. Yes. Happy holidays to everyone. Great 2021. Cheers. See you next year. Cheers. 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 Tune in next week for the latest edition of the Zanbergen Report, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Catch up on our recent shows by visiting podcast.bartzanbergen.com. The Zanbergen Report is also available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Interested in being a featured guest on our show or have a question you'd like to hear us answer? Email podcast at bartzanbergen.com. The contents of this podcast episode do not constitute an offer of securities or a solicitation of an offer to buy securities and may not be relied upon in making an investment decision related to any investment offering Access Wealth Management LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Access does not warrant the accuracy or completeness of the information contained herein. Opinions are our current opinions and are subject to change without notice. Prices, quotes, rates are subject to change without notice. Generally, investments are not FDIC insured, not bank guaranteed, and may lose value. Brokerage services are offered through to Sarah Capital, member FINRA.